All right, let's go through each of the things we need to take care of in order to turn this basic self-attention mechanism into a practical sequence model. So we'll start with positional encodings. All right, so here's the basic problem. What we see when we see some sentence uh, involves both the words in that sentence and the order in which those words occur. So we might see, for example, the sentence, he hit me with a pie. What naive self-attention sees is just a bag of words. So all of the operations in self-attention are permutation invariant, which means that if you were to permute the words, you would get exactly the same attention vectors just permuted in the same way. This is very different from a recurrent model because a recurrent model looks at the words one at a time and it remembers which words it saw before uh, and therefore it can actually remember their order. So a recurrent model understands that the word hit follows the word he, but a self-attention model, at least naively as we've discussed it here, does not understand this. So to the self-attention model, all permutations of these words would, would, would look the same, right? Uh, and some of these permutations are nonsensical, some of them mean the same thing, and some of them actually might mean something different. Most alternative orderings are nonsense, but some actually change the meaning of the sentence. So you really do need to keep track of the order of the tokens in order to process the sequence correctly. So in general, the position of words in a sentence carries important information, and we would very much like to preserve that information uh, when using our self-attention model. So the idea that we're going to explore in this part is to add some information to the beginning, uh, uh, add some, uh, some information uh, to the representation at the beginning, at the bottom of this uh, whole system, that indicates where that token is in the sentence. So we're going to add something to x, uh, xt that will allow the rest of the self-attention mechanism to know where it is relative to the other x's. So in general, positional encoding just means that this first ht is going to be some function of xt as well as t. So up until now, we always said that ht is a function of xt. For example, ht might be obtained by applying a nonlinear layer and something like a Rayleigh nonlinearity to xt. Now we're going to slightly change it by making it some function of xt as well as the time step t. And that's going to preserve uh, the order of the tokens in the sequence and allow self-attention to make use of that. So these are in general called positional encodings. A very naive way to develop a positional encoding would be to just append t to x and then do everything the same way. So if you just uh, have a new type of uh, input, instead of doing xt as the input, you use xt bar, which is just xt concatenated with t. In principle, all of the positional information is in there, and in principle, the self-attentional mechanism can now be aware of the ordering of the words because it knows what their index in the sequence is. This by itself, though, is not a, a really great idea because absolute position is often less important than relative position in most applications that we care about. For example, if I'm doing some natural language processing and I have two sentences, I walk my dog every day and every single day I walk my dog. Now, the index of the words I and walk and the words my and dog are different in these two sentences. They have nothing to do with each other, but the relative positioning is the same. So the fact that my dog is right after I walk is the important part. So if, if for example, someone asks me a question, uh, what do you walk every day? Well, you look at the thing that follows I walk. You don't look at the thing at position three and four, right? So the thing that's important about my dog is where it is relative to the other words in the sentence, not what its absolute index in the sentence is. So it's really these relative positions that are important. So we could come up with a positional encoding that pays more attention to relative positions than it does to absolute positions. Uh, and that's what we're going to try to do. So we want to represent position in a way that tokens with similar relative position have similar positional encoding. And one way we can do this is with a kind of frequency domain representation. So instead of appending the actual time step, we'll append frequencies of the time step. Um, so this is kind of a, a messy uh, equation, but this is actually what was used in the original paper that proposed transformers. Um, they, their positional encoding is actually a vector of the same length uh, as uh, the embedding of xt. So the, the length of the vector is d, that's the dimensionality. 
And every uh, entry in that vector is a sine or a cosine applied to the time step t divided by some frequency. So the frequencies are, uh, are going to go, you know, in this case it's an arbitrary choice, but it's 10,000 to the power 2 times something over d. Okay, so that means that the first entry is the sine of 10,000, uh, the sine of t divided by 10,000 to the power 2 over d. Then you get 10,000 to the power 4 over d. Then you get 10,000 to the power um, 6 over d, and so on and so on, until you get to 10,000 to, uh, to the power d over d, which is just 1. So the earlier entries have very high frequencies because it's t divided by some small number. At the end of the vector, they have very low frequencies. It's t divided by a big number, like 10,000. So the highest frequency is 10,000, which means that you would expect the bottom of this vector to essentially oscillate between negative 1 and 1 every 10,000 uh, tokens. Somewhere in the middle, it'll oscillate between negative 1 and 1 every 1,000 tokens, every 100 tokens, every 10 tokens, etc. Um, so d here, I believe, was on the order of 512 in this case. Of course, the lower d is, the lower you might choose to make that number. So instead of 10,000, if d is, it only goes up to like a 16, maybe you want to use like 100, for example. Because you really want the earlier entries to have very high frequency. You want them to have frequencies basically on the order of 1 or 2. Okay, so if you were to actually draw a picture of these positional encodings, this is what they look like. So every row here is a different dimension of this position encoding vector, and it's sine, cosine, sine, cosine. That's why it looks striped like that, because the sines and cosines oscillate. Um, and then the every point horizontally is the index in the sequence. So the first column is t equals 1, the second column is t equals 2, the third column is t equals 3, etc., etc. So this kind of uh, frequency domain encoding is actually very good for getting relative positions, because the first few rows are essentially even odd indicators. So the very first... Uh, uh, row, maybe it has a frequency of about 1, it's basically going to tell you this, an odd numbered word or an even numbered word. The second uh, indicator is going to roughly tell you is it like the first two or the next two, right? So you'd expect that the word walk and the word dog would have roughly similar values for their positional encoding somewhere in like the third or fourth or maybe the fifth and sixth entries. So that's actually quite nice. Uh, we can get a much uh, better sense of relative position from these kinds of encodings. They're just higher in their dimensionality, but that's okay because you know dimensions are cheap. Okay. So towards the end, when we get into the really low frequencies, like these are now indicators for whether it's something in the first half of the sentence or the second half. Okay. So this is actually a very popular choice for positional encoding. You know, it might come across as a little bit ad hoc, but it tends to actually work pretty well. We could have more sophisticated positional encodings. We could, in fact, actually learn our positional encoding. So if you look at this uh, uh, picture, you know, it basically represents a matrix where the number of rows is equal to the dimensionality d, and the number of columns is equal to the maximal length of the sequence. We could actually learn this entire matrix. We could basically make the entries in this matrix learnable parameters of our model. Um, so uh, at every position we have an x, and that's different for every input sequence. And at every position we also have a p, and that's the same for every sequence, but it's learned. So it's a different p at every time step, but p1 for one sequence is exactly the same as p1 for a different sequence. So it's just a, a kind of a learned uh, constant, essentially. Um, very much like a bias, but time dependent. So it's different at different time steps. Learning positional encodings also tends to work very well. How many values do you need to learn? Well, uh, the entire matrix of positional encodings is just a, a list from, of P1 through Pt. Uh, it has D rows, where D is the dimensionality of the positional encoding that we want. And the number of columns is capital T, which is the length of the longest sequence that we want to process. This has the advantage of being more flexible and perhaps more optimal in some sense than the sine-cosine encoding, because we actually do end up learning the positional encodings that work best for our sequence model. The downside is that it's a little bit more complex, and you need to manually pick the maximum sequence length. So if the longest sequence of training time was 100 steps in length, you won't actually have a positional encoding for step 101, which means you could never generalize to a longer sequence. So that's maybe a little bit unfortunate. 
Um, how do we incorporate these positional encodings into our self-attention model? Well, at each time step, we're going to have our input xt and our positional encoding pt, whether it's the sine cosine thing or a learned thing or anything else. And, you know, it's, just, it's just some vector pt. So a simple naive choice could be to just concatenate them. So instead of just feeding xt, uh, we feed in x bar t, which is xt concatenated with pt. Uh, more often, actually, um, transformer models do something a little different. It's, it's a little bit ad hoc, but uh, it tends to work well, which is that they embed the input first. So they have some kind of embedding function, which it maybe is just a, a linear layer followed by a nonlinearity, and then they add the positional encoding to that embedding. So uh, the uh, encoding is just the, the embedding of xt plus pt. Um, that's kind of an arbitrary choice. Uh, you can combine PT and XD in any other way. You can combine them with two nonlinear layers. But this simple additive thing actually tends to work pretty well. So embedding is some learned function, like a fully connected layer uh, with some linear layers and uh, uh, nonlinearities, and then you just add PT to it. And that becomes your first hidden state. Okay, um, so that's positional encoding. That's how we can basically fix this bag of words problem and make the self-attention actually aware of where the words are relative to each other. Yeah. Next, let's talk about multi-headed attention. All right, so since we're relying entirely on attention now, it might be really desirable to allow the self-attention mechanism to incorporate information from more than one time step. So, for example, maybe at position two, you really want to get the subject of the sentence and the verb and somehow combine the two of them. So maybe you would like your attention mechanism to fetch the subject and separately you would like a different attention mechanism to go fetch the verb so that you can put them together. So the way that you can do this is you can have a key query and value uh, at every step. Um, uh, and na naively, you would just combine them to get an attention uh, but because of the, uh, of the softmax, this would really mostly pay attention to just one time step. So if the subject and the verb are at different points in time, which they always are, uh, you wouldn't be able to get them both. You would just be able to get one of them. Uh, and then when you combine them, it's kind of hard to specify that you want two different things. Um, so you can't, can't really encode into your, into your key or query that I want kind of an or. I want like either the subject or the verb. So you can't get both, and you'll mostly fixate on just one thing, so you can't really pull information from two points in time into a single time step. So here's how we can fix this. What we're going to do is instead of outputting one key query value tuple, we'll actually output multiple. So the different color outlines represent different heads. We'll have a green attention, a blue attention, and a red attention. And the green attention will produce an attention vector, by using the query, the green query, to match it with the green keys and then use the, the, the dot product to get the green values. So maybe green here represents like subject. And then we'll do the same thing for blue. We'll use the blue queries to match them with the blue keys to get the blue values. And maybe that pulls out the verb. And then we'll do the same thing for the red attentions. We'll take the red queries, combine them with the red keys, and get the red values. And maybe that pays attention to some third type of information. So you compute the weights completely independently for each attention head. So now your attention score has three subscripts. It's E, L, T, I, where L is the position at which you're computing the attention, T is the position from which you're trying to get the values, and I is the head. And you have completely separate queries and keys for every I. And then you do the softmax separately for every I, and you compute the attention vectors completely separately for every I. And then at the end, the full attention vector is formed simply by concatenating these. So you have, uh, at position two, you have A21, A22, and A23, so three different heads. So the full attention vector A2 is just formed by stacking these different attention heads. So now uh, maybe one of the, those heads pulls out the verb, another pulls out the subject, another pulls out maybe some adjective, and you combine, combine them all together, and then make a, the next decision at the next layer by using that combined information. And that can be a lot more powerful. In the same way that you would never build a convnet with just a single filter per conv layer, uh, it's a really good idea to build self-attention with multiple heads per self-attention layer. Oftentimes, somewhere around eight heads seems to work pretty well for big models. One head is much more powerful than one filter in a convnet because each head is still multidimensional. So each of those attention vectors uh, 
A2, A21, A22, and A23 is actually multiple numbers. So for example, in the classic transformer model, the dimensionality uh, of the full attention vector is 512, and it's split into eight separate uh, heads. So uh, you take 512 divided by eight, and that's the size of each of the heads. Okay, so that's multi-headed attention. Now let's talk about how to make self-attention more nonlinear. Okay, so, so far, self-attention is actually entirely linear in the values. So remember that our keys, our queries, and our values are linear functions of HT. They're different linear functions, so we have a different matrix WK, WQ, and WV. And they're different matrices at every self-attention layer. So the first self-attention layer has one set of weights. The second self-attention layer has a different set of weights. Our weights uh, for the attention, our alphas, are calculated by applying a softmax, which is a nonlinear operation. But our actual attention is obtained with a linear combination of the values weighted by uh, those softmax scores. So the attention is linear in the Vs, and the Vs are linear in the Hs. Right? So you could equivalently write your attention as a sum over all the time steps of alpha LT of WV times HT. And uh, since uh, uh, you have the distributive property, you can push the matrix outside of the sum and just get WV times the sum over T of alpha LT times HT. So here you can see that it's linear in HT except for the, uh, for the attention weights. So we make a nonlinear choice about which time step to attend to, but then we make a linear transformation of the H's of that time step, which means the H's don't get transformed nonlinearly. So okay, we have a nonlinear transformation apply, a linear transformation applied to nonlinear weights. So every self-attention layer is a linear transformation of the previous layer with nonlinear weights. And this is not very expressive. This is not actually that powerful of an operation. So, Intuitively, what self-attention is really good at is it's good at fetching information from other points in time, but it's not very good at doing some complex processing on that information. So maybe you want to pull in the subject and the verb, and then you want some operation like say, well, if the subject is, uh, is a person and the verb is something like this, then we opt for one thing, and if the subject is some inanimate object, then we opt for a different thing, right? So that kind of operation is difficult to do if everything is linear. So what we'd really like to do is somehow insert nonlinearities into this process. And one very simple way to do it uh, is to simply alternate self-attention with some kind of nonlinear layer. So we're going to use self-attention to compute A1, A2, and A3, so A, A T for every time step T. And then we'll apply some nonlinear operation independently at every time step to get the next layer hidden states. So we start off with the hidden states uh, HT1 at layer 1, we're going to get attention at layer 1, and then we'll compute the hidden state for layer 2, HT2. So this could be some learned nonlinear function, like for example a linear layer followed by a nonlinearity, and it will be applied independently at every time step. It's the same function at every time step, but applied independently. So you can sort of think of self-attention as exchanging information between time steps, and this position-wise function as processing that information. So kind of self-attention is like the memory fetch, and then this thing is the actual computation. And then we do another memory fetch, then another computation, then another memory fetch. So it's just a neural net applied at every position after every self-attention layer. And sometimes this is referred to as a position-wise feed-forward network. So we'll describe some specific commonly used choices shortly, but for now it's just some kind of learned nonlinear function that is applied independently at every time step, and then you alternate self-attention, nonlinear function, self-attention, nonlinear function. And it's a different self-attention, a different nonlinear function each time. Okay, there you go. All right, so, so far, we've figured out positional encodings, we've figured out how to make attention multi-headed, and we've figured out how to insert these alternating nonlinear functions to get our self-attention model to actually perform some complex computation. Now there is one last thing that we need to do uh, to make this actually work for practical sequences, which is to figure out how to use it for decoding, uh, or general for generation. So the trouble with self-attention is that it doesn't distinguish between past and future. So, it can, so the attention uh, lookups can look up information from previous steps in the sequence. They can also look up information from future steps in the sequence. Um, and this can be a little bit of a problem because 
you know, if you're using this to just process a given input sequence, like a sentence in French, so they can later produce a sentence in English, totally fine, no problem. But if you're using this during a generation process, during a decoding process, what you would like to do is you would like to have the first time step only use information from the first step to generate the output of the first step. Then you want to use that output as an input to the second step, which can then process that information, including information from the first step, and then produce the output of the second step. Then you want to pass this on to the third step, to the third step, and then the third step needs to be able to look up into the second step and the first step, right, and produce the output of the third step. So a crude self-attentional language model can actually see the future uh, because nothing is preventing these attention lookups uh, from uh, actually uh, not looking into our future time steps. So in reality, of course, we have many uh, alternating self-attention layers and position-wise feed-forward networks, but for now we'll just analyze just one. Um, so if we're decoding, uh, maybe we have a self-attention layer, then a position-wise nonlinearity, and then at the first time step we decode y2, y2 hat, that's our guess of y2. And then we would set uh, y2 hat as the actual input of the second step, y2, and then decode from there, and set y3 as the actual input of the third step, uh, y3. But when we're performing that computation for the first step, its attention mechanism can actually peak into the second and third time step. But we have a big problem here because self-attention at step one can look at the value at steps two and three, but those values are based on the inputs at steps two and three, and during decoding, the inputs at steps two and three are based on the outputs at steps one and two. So at test time when decoding, the inputs at steps two and three will depend on the output at step one, but the output of step one depends on the attention at step one which depends on the inputs at steps two and three. So it's a circular dependency, which means that we can't use this to decode one token at a time. We can't use this to generate an entire sentence, right? Because generating the output at step one requires knowing the inputs at steps two and three, but those inputs are determined by the output at step one. So there's a very simple fix that we can use uh, to remove this problem, which is called masked attention. Basically, you have to allow self-attention into the past, you have to, you know, if you're at time step two, you, you're allowed to peak at steps one and two, but you don't allow uh, self-attention to the future. So at time step two, you're not allowed to look at time step three. So there's an easy solution, which is to basically delete these connections into the future. Mathematically, the way you do that is before your attention score, EL comma T is QL times KT, right? So if you want to figure out how suitable the value at time step T is, to pass to another time step L, it's just QL times KT. But if QL, if the query, comes from an earlier step than the key KT, you want to disallow that. So a simple way to do that is just alter the rule for computing these attention scores. Now, if L comes, if L is greater than or equal to T, meaning that the key comes at, a at the same time step or earlier, then the same QL dotted with KT as before. But if it's later, meaning that if the key comes later than the query, then you set the attention score to negative infinity, which means that when you put it into the softmax, e to the negative infinity is zero, so that future time step will always have a, a weight of zero and it will never be used. Uh, and that will prevent this problem. And now you can actually use a self-attention model to decode, because now time step one will only do self-attention lookups into earlier steps, never into later steps. Now, of course, in reality, uh, dealing with these infinities uh, in, in actual code can get really annoying. Like you kind of don't want to deal with infinities uh, in your code. So uh, a really simple way to do this in practice is to just replace the exponential of EL comma T with zero for every L uh, that is uh, less than T. Uh, and you can just do this inside your softmax calculation. So that will basically zero out uh, the alphas uh, for any lookup into the future. Okay. So just to summarize these different implementation choices that we discussed, we can implement a practical sequence model based entirely on self-attention. Uh, and if you uh, incorporate these four modifications that I described in this part of the lecture, this thing will actually work. Um, you have to alternate self-attention layers with nonlinear position-wise feedforward networks to get nonlinear transformations. You have to use positional encoding um, on the input or, or input embedding 
to make the model aware of the relative position of the tokens relative to each other in the sequence. Uh, you have to use multi-headed attention, so you can incorporate information from multiple different time steps at each self-attention layer. And lastly, if you want to use the model to decode, to generate, you have to use masked attention uh, so that you don't perform these lookups into the future. So in the next part of the lecture, uh, we're going to see how we can use these basic building blocks to actually construct a version of the sequence-to-sequence -sequence models using only self-attention. And we'll use masked attention for the decoder and regular self-attention for the encoder, together with all these tricks.